think I just unmuted. So welcome everybody to uh, our first uh, TWED of the fall 2022 semester and our, our first in-person TWED in a very long time. Um, we're very happy to have Jamie McCusker here to take us through why is 2.0, probably the why is 1.0 was probably one of our last TWEDs. <laughs> um, but uh, so I'm going to uh, switch off our screen okay. share and. Okay. Sure. So. So, hi, yeah, uh, we are going to be talking about uh, why is 2.0 today and yes, I'm going to sh start sharing sc my screen. Um, logistical thing. Sorry, I'm out of practice. Yeah, sure. Um, so just as a, a couple logistical notes, I should mention uh, number one, uh, this is being recorded uh, for later presentation in the web. Oh, wait, sorry. They can uh, probably be seen. I don't think, I don't think I'm, uh, I wasn't muted. Oh, sorry. That's, that's okay. Um, so it's being recorded. So feel free to ask questions. Well, if we, if our discussions get too long, I may uh, expedite the presentation, um, but just keep in mind that we are being recorded uh, forever and ever, amen, on the web. Um, and you can find a schedule for upcoming uh, TWEDs and also our Pirates, the RPI, our, our users group meetings on tw.rpi.edu slash TWED. Um, and I think that's cool. Yeah, yeah it just made it better. So. Okay, so yeah, um, why is 2.0 is uh, basically the next ver the next version of why is uh, one of the nice things about it is that it is uh, very it uh, we put a lot of effort into making sure that it is a um, a fully uh, a, a very simple uh, uh, system to use and install. Um, so, uh, why is this available as a Python package? Uh, it's, uh, available to run basically directly on laptops, uh, in a very straightforward embedded mode. Uh, it has a lot of scripts and support around, uh, deploying to both, uh, Docker containers and to, um, and to, uh, um, uh, production servers. This is virtual machines. So that's all set up in a way that, uh, where um, kind of we've solved a lot of those problems for you, uh, a lot of scripts around that. So uh, hopefully this actually will um, help you, uh, this will help uh, you uh, kind of get started with why is. Uh, the other thing we've done is we made sure that the out of box experience is uh, quite a bit better than the old one. You can actually use why is uh, for basic knowledge graph uh, applications without writing any software. Um, this is, Big deal for us because that's not something we generally do uh, in our field. Uh, so hopefully this will uh, this will do, uh, help that along. The nice thing about why is is that because of the way it's structured, even though you might start off with a a no code project where you're not actually writing any uh, software, you may decide later on that you need some you need something in place that will uh, do one of those things. You know, it will, you know, maybe you need uh, uh, a custom view or a custom agent. And I'll talk about what those are in a little while. Um, uh, you can transition from just doing uh, just loading data and exploring it all the way over to uh, writing a custom knowledge graph uh, without uh, without any disruptions. You, you can uh, you can just start tinkering with it. And I'll uh, hopefully help, I'll have time to uh, kind of show off where you would go about uh, making those changes and how you would go about doing it. So, for those of you who are, there we go. Uh, those of you who are uh, familiar with uh, the old WIAS architecture, um, we've uh, made a number of changes to. Um, to the uh, approach that we've uh, had in, in a lot of the technologies that we have. Um, uh, the original uh, version of Y is was based on uh, Blaze Graph, which um, 
is has been a wonderful uh, tool, but it's rather monolithic and has been, um, you know, it uh, basically the entire team's been absorbed by Amazon, and so the support isn't what it used to be, and so we've decided to switch over to uh, using uh, Fuseki from the Apache Jenna Apache Jenna project, which is um, very actively developed and. Uh, is modular, and we are actually able to write an uh, extension to Fuseki as part of the uh, transition over to uh, of Wyas to to it, and so uh, that that's kind of part of the uh, appeal now of Wyas is that you can actually tinker with Fuseki itself as part of one of your Wyas projects. Uh, you don't need uh, and basically add develop and add modules to to Fuseki to add new things, whether it's geospatial or uh, if you want to write a authentication or authorization module or um, do any of those other sorts of things. That's absolutely there. It's got good DNA. It's got good DNA, yeah. Um, and Fuseki is yes a very venerable uh, project that goes back uh, since basically before I've been involved with the Semantic Web. Um, so uh, another uh, change, another major change is uh, the use of um, we were using a JavaScript framework called Angular JS, um, which is uh, back in the back in the day it was actually a very convenient way to kind of uh, kind of do model view controllers in JavaScript, and we had a lot of success with that. Um, but uh, uh, Angular has been showing its uh, its age. For quite a while, and we haven't actually moved along to uh, Angular uh, two, even Angular two point oh, which is radically different from what we're using with A Angular one point oh. And so um, we kind of did a reevaluation of what we were do of what we we're doing, and realized that um, uh, Vue.js is actually more in line with the sort of uh, component system that we really want to, to use and to make, and it's much lighter weight. And we we're able to uh, we're switching in the process of switching over a lot of the front end components to Vue.js from Angular. There's still a lot of uh, technology that's using Angular, but going forward, as we make new user interfaces in Wyas, we will be using Vue, um, and, and we will be gradually transitioning those over to Vue from Angular. And actually, one of those first um, one of those first components that we've uh, been trying to switch over is uh, the uh, the, fa the original faceted browser from Wyas, which was useful but kind of unreliable in some ways. Um, uh, we've uh, basically uh, built out this uh, visualization framework, and actually still have to come up with a good name for it because it's not going to be BobViz. That's a nod to Prov. Um, when back in the back in the very beginning of Prov, we called Prov entity just Bob because we didn't want to bias ourselves towards any one name or another. Um, so I've been calling it BobViz just because there's not a good name for it yet. Um, but what it is is basically a framework for plugging in um, uh, search capability, so basically uh, formulating and executing a Sparkle query with visualization or exploration capabilities, being able to uh, display the results of that query somehow. And the very basic version, and I'll show you a very basic version of it, uh, which is uh, you write a Sparkle query and then you write a, 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 Vega, um, uh, a Vega specification for a visualization and you can and get this lovely uh, graph. The other. That is far more appealing to me than it should be. Yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna, I, I might, I might do that and. That's a yes, that's extremely tempting. I love a good pun. Um, okay, so. Uh, We've also integrated uh, data Voyager in with us so that instead of just writing a um, instead of writing a uh, um, a, a view uh, visualization directly, you can use a user interface to compose one. And so hopefully I'll be able to show that um, I've got some demo data that I might be able to 
probably be able to use for this. Uh, and then the other thing is that, uh, so the BobViz uh, system, actually, the idea is that a lot of these um, pieces that you see with um, when you're doing these sorts of tasks, whether it's looking at a gallery of instances that you, you know, you either you've just got a Sparkle query and you want to see those uh, kind of summaries of those instances while you use maybe a faceted browser, just a straight query uh, and a gallery component to do that or an album component. Um, when you're just showing a visualization, you just kind of have the metadata and you don't really offer editing of the, the data. You just run the query. Um, uh, and then when you're doing a, uh, when you're editing a visualization, you would then show an editor for the Sparkle query or whatever else you're, you're using. So that, that's the idea is that th this will eventually, eventually, it's not quite there yet, um, become a, a way for people to, uh, to compose novel user interactions within WIAs without, without using a lot of code, right? Um, you'll be reusing the, you know, you can mix and match a lot of these components to do interesting things. And hopefully when it comes time to actually write a knowledge graph, you can just plug them together um, uh, using, it would be probably about five lines of HTML to, to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, do you see that non on device or in the team, they can still work on the same thing without knowing the techniques of it? Like in results. Right, yeah, so that's that's the idea is that um, people who know how to um, people who are uh, who can write uh, tools for uh, to, that can you know write sparkle queries for them. So like a faceted browser or something else, uh, you know those those sorts of uh, people who are really good with Sparkle can write those sorts of tools. And then you and then other people who are building knowledge graphs, but maybe aren't like Sparkle experts. Can still put together sophisticated uh, knowledge exploration tools using those pre built components. Um, so that's that last page was more vision than anything else. Um, yeah, this is the all this is so one of the cool things, one of the cool things, yeah. Um, some, one of the cool things, though, about this this graphic is that I didn't have to change it at all. It still applies. This is this is why is 2.0 as well. And over the course of I guess it's been five years, um, this architecture has held up and hasn't had to change at all. Um, and so you know we still have uh, we still have uh, basically knowledge curation through. Uh, through agents uh, that can uh, either read in, you know, actually we've filled in this gap. We didn't have semantic data dictionaries way back in the day. That was a visionary thing. That's now done. Semantic ETL is being done through Settler. Uh, we have some NLP uh, pieces in place. We haven't really done much machine learning yet, but we really want to. Um, and, uh, you know, the linked open data mapping has been like a workhorse of, of why is over the years. Uh, you know, whether it's mapping in OBO uh, ontologies class by class, whether it's been pulling in uh, ORCID and DOI identifiers and pulling in metadata from, from there or using DBpedia or anything else, it just keeps going and uh, we keep finding new interesting things to do with it, including on-demand loading of files from remote sources so that we can actually, you know, uh, do semantic ETL of these files that are published somewhere, pull them through, process them, and then publish the, the data uh, right to the graph. So it's all, it's actually been really cool on that end. Um, these, uh, uh, the knowledge interaction piece um, is still uh, still works more or less the same way that it always has. Um, uh, it uses uh, views to uh, you know every every entity in the graph has at least one view, and there are lots of views available uh, for many of these things. Some of them are uh, web based, uh, so HTML pages. Some of them are data oriented, and so they're uh, usually JSON-based APIs that are based on these views. 
and all these things are actually really um, just you know that they, they they continue to work, and a lot of these pieces have been more about changing what's the content of those views than about actually changing the underlying architecture. Um, and so, you know, some stuff that we're looking at for views is like, well, how do, what do you do when you want to post something to an entity? What is, what would that mean? Uh, so questions like that are more like, you know, how do we expand on what we already have rather than how do we, uh, how do we uh, change what's already there? So that's again, held up really well. The post you meant. Like, yeah, exactly. Like HTTP post, you know, what does it mean to, uh, if you want to post a, a revision of a fragment of a CSV file to that CSV, you could potentially do that. You know, you just need to write that view to do, to do the processing. Um, and then similarly with knowledge inference, the, uh, the, uh, the inference agents are, uh, you know, the same that they've always been. Uh, and really are uh, still uh, still working on a nano publication and by nano publication basis. The, the use of nano publications for and and the use of, of prov uh, prov oriented nano publications to trace changes in the graph, all of that's still the same. And so a lot of it's been like, how do we improve this performance, or how do we deal with this corner case that we didn't hit before? Um, but all of these underlying concepts have held up for five years. Um, and so the, the main thing, again, this is another dusty, uh, uh, dusty slide, um, but I actually did dust it off. Uh, basically, uh, so I took off the specifics about JavaScript, this JavaScript stuff, because we're kind of in transition right now and I wanted to have it be honest. Uh, but again, you know, there are views. There's linked data mapping. There's, uh, I used to call them knowledge expansion agents, inference agents that I mentioned. Um, and one of the main differences is that um, we've changed over to Fizaki from, uh, from Blazegraph. And so that's been really, um, that's pretty much it, right? The, the, the rest of this still, again, holds up. And we haven't had to add any backdoors. We haven't had to add any new um, features in terms of the architecture design for quite a long time. And, um, you know, some of it's stubbornness on my part, but a lot of it's just been that what we've been able to get those things to work in a lot of different situations in five or six different projects. So that's been really, uh, really valuable. I think that we were able to do that. Okay, so that's that, that's all I. There's a there's an architectural question. Yeah. Can it make sense? So the, the, the first is just kind of a comment. Mm -hmm. I may have mentioned this before. Is that there's a certain some of this is, is kind of analogous to the repository. Yeah, yeah. One of the novel things. So that was kind of that their architecture was sort of based on um not this version. This mm -hmm. had a visual object. Essentially, through different kinds of balls of the object. Right, to yeah. Disseminate different manifestations of it mm -hmm. or information about it. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and so, and there was also, to some extent, there was a, the converse was this is where things get to the first sense. You could conceivably modify the other. Right, yeah, yeah. But I'm, I'm, I'm wondering where that sort of direct interaction, not a browser version, but a sort of a API or kind of virtual API to interact. Is from a dissemination standpoint, does that, that, does that kind of fall under custom views? Where would you put yeah. API rather than browser? Yeah, so that's these custom views. And so about at least half of the 
uh, the views that are used in WIAs are actually data views. So I distinguish between web views and data views. Web views serve HTML. Data views serve JSON or, or XML or some other data orient data structure. And um, the difference there is more a matter of what you write than anything else. Um, you know, rather than writing you know template name dot HTML, you write template name dot JSON, and it serves up JSON instead. So it's a post. It's a special yeah, case. That, that's a, yeah, that's a special case that we're still I'm still trying to consider. Um, and it's something that I mean, so on the one hand, this has been sitting around for five years. On the other hand, I've been thinking about. What we, what a post would mean in this architecture for about 3 of those years. So that's not, um, you know, that's part of. Part of this process is, you know, trying to make sure that I'm thinking through. What each of these things means. Right, yeah, yeah. And so, you know, the, the post is usually a modification or creation process. Um, you know, there's also put and patch and so forth and delete. Um, right now, um, if you were to, uh, if you post a file to a, uh, to a URI in WIAS, it will upload that file and actually serve it back to you whenever you do a get on it. So it basically turns that. It basically means that that um, that URI is representing the file you you posted, and you can post a new file each time, um, and you can provide some basic type information as part of the post parameters, um, and you can and it's basically an entity in the graph, so you can link to it. Link you can add other facts about it. You can link to other stuff. So we do have some semantics around uh, post and delete for. Uh, for file oriented uh, ent uh, entities or resources. Um, and we also have that available for um, the nano publications themselves. Hmm? Yeah. Yeah, I can. So if you um, so, and actually, one of the fun things is that I have uh, Perl.org slash uh, Y is slash local slash redirects to localhost colon 5000. And that's also the default URI space for Y is when you install it from scratch. I promise to keep things moving. Yeah, 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 I know you're. Good. Yeah, good job. Um, okay, so let's see here. I am going to, oh, right. So one thing I want to show off it to, to show my, um, uh, to show what we've been up to is we've also put in a lot of effort into documentation um, that we have. Uh, so a lot of this stuff actually had been available previously as part 2.0. Um, I've translated over as much as I could to, uh, to 2.0, uh, added some new things around um, installing YS and um, uh, uh, reference uh, documentation for the command line interface and the, AP and the web API. Um, and yeah, so if you have, yeah, so if you actually do a get on something that's like a direct, a direct link into whatever this the the LOD prefixes. I'll talk about that more later though. Um, anyway, the um so actually let me just was it bigger. Okay, so um so why is like I said as a as a uh, Python package. Uh, so one of the first things you want to make sure is that you have uh Python 3.9 installed, uh, or uh, 3.7 or later. I've been doing most of my work with 3.9. Um, that seems to be very solid and stable and generally available, so go for it. Um, the other thing you need is, um, is uh, Java. Is it? 
Yeah, so you, you need um, a Java 13 or later for uh, Fuseki. So you need to make sure that's installed. Uh, between those two, that should be about it. Um, I think you, I think that covers most, I think everything else is covered as part of the installation process. So, um. Uh, Jenna, Fuseki uses Jenna kind of throughout, so it's built on Jenna. Yeah. Let's see. Um, let's see. Pip is usually part of, comes with Python, at least these days. So what I'm going to do uh, is this command in, in Python called v, uh, Ven. It's a virtual environment. Most people who I've dealt with before, or who I've talked to you about this process before, I've been pushing really hard. But people use virtual environments for Python because really it's kind of a mess if you don't. And so I really, 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 really recommend you do this. Except in Docker, you're not supposed to do it at all. Although now, actually, the, the, the Docker image also uses for, uh, virtual and. Um, why is uh, demo? Hmm? Well, so uh, Docker itself is just a, it's an OS environment, right? Uh, basically a virtualized OS environment, containerized, not always virtual. Um, what happens inside of there is that the, um, you still need to do the same stuff to run Python that you would otherwise. Right. You can install stuff into the system Python packages just fine, but just from as a matter of kind of knowing where stuff is, I prefer to build the virtual env all, uh, already. And part of it's that uh, then I you know, it's just a little bit more predictable between everything. So, okay, so I create a, uh, a VENV, then you have to activate it. Um, why is demo bin activate? And no, I have not tested this with, this with Anaconda. I've grown disillusioned with Anaconda like 10 years ago. <laughs> really don't like it. If you want to use it, go for it. But you're, you know, supposedly all the PIP stuff also works in. in you can use a pip package in con in conda as well uh, because pip, uh, the python packages have become much more comprehensive than they used to be uh, and so a lot of the stuff that was hard to install using pip now actually is pretty easy and you're about, you're about, about to see that yeah sure if you have a gpu and you install a package that uses it and write an agent that uses it, it'll use it. There's nothing in there's nothing in Wise that requires it. There's nothing in Wise that prevents you from using it either. Yes. Um, although I think, well, so depending. You know, it's a matter of style, right? And so um, Anaconda is not really, it's really good for like data science type stuff, but it's not really, um, I wouldn't use it for uh, for setting up a, uh, like a, uh, a server deployment or something like that. I don't know how, you know, I, I've seen, seen it get temperamental with a lot of that stuff. And it's much more opaque in terms of what it's doing. Like I just made a directory called why is demo venv? I know where it is. If I want to get rid of it, I just delete that directory. Um, pip install why is this is the moment of truth. Um, actually, why did it do that? Oh, sorry, that's actually an old one. Um, I just, I just made, a, I already had this in place. Yeah, I'll just do that. Why is V E N B Source. Uh, why is 
Bnb bin activate. So I want to make sure that I'm not cheating for this. So I'm doing an empty one. Okay, so it's it is cat it is catching everything uh, because I've already tested this. But it's good you don't have to wait for downloads. It could be either. It could be either Redis or um, Kuzeki itself. So actually, I don't know if you had the Java command set up properly within there. Um, but also, if if you're doing like the the um, the Linux subsystem, yeah. that would probably yeah that would probably fail spectacularly. Well, he already invested in the hardware, and you know. Okay. Cool. Yeah, that, that's promising. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Yeah, you don't. Well, the other thing is that you can just use Docker now. Um, I'm not going to go over the process in this. Don't do research computing. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, so we've installed Wires, um, lots of sub packages, lots of things that can go wrong, um, but it didn't thankfully. Uh, okay, so what what did we do? All oh, right. Um, so uh, the uh, knowledge graph application in Wires, I've been calling them KG apps, so like web apps, but Knowledge graphs, so KG apps. So um, I'm going to make a directory called uh, demo KG app. And then from here, literally all we need to do to, to start Y is, is run Y is. It would, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. There we go. Just, just, just compiling everything. Um, so, but it's do. let me run through exactly what it's doing here. Because I know you guys are fascinated by this. Um, so what it's doing, so there's, uh, I'll, I'll explain kind of the, the configuration system, maybe if we have time, um, but basically there's the, the KG app configuration and then there's the system configuration. System configuration is for deployments on production. Uh, there's this idea of an embedded configuration, which the idea is that it's, uh, what it does is it has some defaults in place that lets you run everything locally. So you can take the same uh, KG app, run it on your laptop, and then also be able to deploy it to a server and it won't, uh, everything will work the same. Uh, and because you don't have a system, dot, a system config uh, set up on your laptop, you won't, you know, you won't be using those things that will use the kind of the built-in stuff. Um, Whereas when you deploy it to production, it will use the, the system.conf that you created. It starts Fuseki on a random port. Um, so you can actually have multiples of these running at once. Um, it will then build out uh, uh, the uh, endpoints in, in uh, Fuseki for you. It starts a Redis instance, which is used as a built-in board for the uh, inference agent system. Um, and then it starts Celery, which actually runs the, uh, which actually runs the inference agents. So that's the infrastructure in Python that goes to the bulletin board and actually pulls tasks down and so forth. 
and so every um, uh, all the agents are actually uh, they're not direct salary tasks uh, for those of you who know how salary works, but it is basically all of the steps of the inference agent process are different tasks and salary so that it's kind of processed through that. Um, it's also set up so that you can monitor kind of uh, tasks because they do are they are marked with the agent type and the URI of the nano publication supposed to be looking at and all that sort of stuff. So that's it. Redis is so Redis is an embedded database um, and it's used to uh, be it, it's uh, it is a um, basically serves as the bulletin board for tasks for salary. And salary is what actually runs the inference agent system. Yeah, exactly. So is every time you run Yes, that is something you can set up if you like. Um, Right, yeah, yeah. So what would happen? Um, here, let me show you what it, it's actually created. Um, new window. Here, I'll hide all this other junk. Not yet, or if they did, it hasn't reached my computer. Could be, uh, but I mean, it's an open source project, right? So, okay, so demo KG app. So what what we have here? Oh, can I make this? No, I can't make it bigger. Um, right. So ys.com contains the like I said the kind of the 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 functional aspects of the knowledge graph. So things like what the LED prefix is, or um, kind of where to look for the vocab file, which are, just defines the views and the site name description, um, what inference agents to run, what um, what link data importers to use, and so forth and so on. Yeah, it's yeah, yes, it is. Um, the other thing that you come with is so there's this so right now at the moment because there's a system running. There's this embedded.com file. And this is actually written out as JSON. Actually, it's a pain in the butt to read. Sorry. Uh, but what, what there is is there's basically uh, when you run um, install it on a system, there's a system.com file that sits right next to the YS file in the same directory. And what that does is that configures that has that tells YS where to look for Fuseki, where to look for Redis, where to look for salary, and all that sort, sort of stuff. And it also is set up to be um, basically it's it's meant to be configured on a server. Uh, there's also and actually I think I've got right. So in here is the system.com file, which has some um, which has some uh, specific uh, uh, variables in here that get replaced. So when you actually install it on a server, this gets written through and so forth and so on. Um, but basically, uh, there's a script that goes through it and installs all this stuff into the server, sets up a Fuseki dot service into your system dot D, uh, sets up uh, celery and celery beat service to do the same, um, and installs Redis. And if you look, yes, they're like a limited Python file, but yeah. Yes, the ones that have to that go. That's how. Um, that's actually a Flask thing. So if you have, uh, if you have Flask using a, um, you're writing a, a Flask configuration file, 
you use this to distinguish between uh, variable uh, entries that are not actually configuration values and just regular variables. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, here's one. Yeah. Um, and so the. Uh, so setup actually goes through the process of, so you just run this on your server when you're ready to deploy. It will it will uh, go through and install Redis. It'll install install Apache and the Python that you need. Um, it will set up the the directory the directories you want, um, and uh, configure Celery as needed. It will uh, it'll you know pass through these the, these files and add configurations to them and basically start all the services. So it's basically full fledged. Uh, you can go from like I can take this. This uh, KG app that I just generated, copy it over to a server, run it, and get the same experience that I had on my laptop, except it's production. No, no, it's the set. Well, it's the rest of the stuff that used to be in that. So the old, uh, the old config that pie that used to be in Wires was the combination. It had stuff from wires.com and system.com uh, put together. And so this is the idea with the split, splitting it out makes it easier to deploy and embed. Yes. Yes. I'm sure. Yeah. Well, some of this is I, I'm not trying to get uh, try, trying to get everyone up to speed on kind of a lot of this stuff. So. When we start off with a knowledge graph, we have just a basic page that starts up. And as I said before, um, there's a, uh, you know, when we look in ys.conf, uh, so this is the LED prefix. Um, so uh, when we go here, we're actually serving up hey, this page, that URI. Uh, so even this page has a URI associated with it. So when you Launched it. There was a couple different URLs that were provided. This was the last. Right. Um, which ones? These guys. Socket ones. That's not going to work. No, that's the only one. Oh wait, these guys. Yeah. So. Oops. So yeah, so if you, it basically, so you can actually go, once you know what the, you know, it's telling you this so that you can access it directly if you need to. Um, okay. So you do still have to register in order to change, make changes in the graph. Um, you can do this through the command line as well, um, but I want to show the, in, the user interface for uh, joining. Husker. Uh, RPI.edu. No. You. Okay. So register, and then what you have is so there's another prompt to add knowledge because it's an empty knowledge graph right now. Um, so we can start by uploading a bit of knowledge. And what I'm going to add actually is going to be some very simple knowledge that we have, which is in the, uh, in why as we have this, there we go. There we are, base.trig. So this is basically SCOS and DC terms and RDF and OWL, RDFS, all the labels for those namespaces are all in this base.trig. It's a really valuable thing to start with. Um, and it's got them all broken out into separate name graphs, so you don't have to, To do that, and so that's basically added things. And oh, look, now we have instances of stuff. 
Um, and so if we look at, uh, for instance, so this is, this is a gallery or, uh, album, depending on how you want to think about it of kind of the top. 6 types in, in the graph. And as we add new stuff to the graph, we will actually, we'll see that change. Because this one is our classes. This one is RDFS classes. And so the other thing is that when we look at an actual uh, a, 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 a class view, it automatically shows all the instances of that view or of, of that class. Oh, so this is fun. So um, we have, oh, this isn't gonna show, yeah, that's, that's just, that, that's all of them. Uh, but if we look at RDF, RDFS class, I think we have more than 20 in here. Um, and so what we do is we have a, no, actually, yep, we have an infinite scroll. So it only shows a little bit at a time and every time we have Every time you bounce off the bottom, it will show a little bit more. I think it's 24 at a time. So, of course, I'm showing it five wide because it's the only thing that we're. So, you know, this is a fun, you know, re, I love flex. It's so cool to be able to do that. I've been waiting years to be able to do that. And oops. Yes, yeah. In fact, uh, when I load the data that we're going, we're going to use, I think that will actually work. Um, one thing I'm going to do is I'm also going to add um, I'm going to add SIO to this because we use SIO for a couple of things in the in the example data. Um, so labels. Oh, that's an old one. Oh well, that's probably fine. Format um RDFXML. So we can keep adding, you can just add turtle from anywhere using that menu um, afterwards. And actually now we should get even more, we should have even more OWL classes because we just added SIO to this. So yeah, all sorts of stuff in here now. I'm just double checking that, yeah, okay, cool. So the other thing we can do, um, so as I'd mentioned before, uh, uh, we you can upload data into WIAs for processing or just for publication. Um, this is a pretty cool thing that um, we added as part of a pro one of our projects. Uh, but this is actually this. So you'll see this is actually um, a view where the URI is DCAT data set. And the view is new, so it's actually. Uh, if you were to go to any class, you would get something. That allows you to create a new instance of that class. The, the one that's in there right now, the default one isn't that great, but the idea is that. When you have a, an action like that, that you're trying to do those would always be done to a specific view. So, uh, new, uh, view new, uh, and edit are all kind of standard. Uh, web facing uh, views that we have in WIAs that you should use. Uh, other ones include explore and gallery and other stuff like that. So, like the gallery view will show all the instances of it by itself instead of having it be in the main page. Um, if we had a DOI for this data set, I would I could just plug it in and it would load that through. 
I'm just going to select some files though. Um, Journey data, files demo data. So this is a uh, data file of, this is the um, 20, uh, 2010 census. Uh, hold on, Let's pull that up. So, yep, yeah. uh, so I modified it a little bit and make it a bit more tidy because the original, the official one is really kind of gross. Um, so county, state, uh, census, it's still not tidy, I know. The part of it that I'm going to use is tidy. I'm just using the, the census value. I'm not going to use the other stuff. Yeah, I know. I know. You can add a preview image for this. Actually, I'm going to try to find one real quick that. Um, uh, here. This is a logo for my race, but whatever. So um, we'll pretend that's has something to do with the census. Um, so it will upload um, the census 2010. I'm going to make myself the uh, so one thing we expect is that we use ORCID identifiers as contact points for these. So I'm going to grab my ORCID. Um, and we don't have it mapped in yet, so uh, let's see here. Uh, and then there's, um, you can add, you can look up contributors. Uh, add those, uh, set a publication, modified date. I'm going to do today for both of them. And so it'll show you a summary of it and then you submit. Uh, and then, um, in the end, that's, you know, that's what you get. So you have the, the, uh, a summary of that, of that data set. Um, and this is, you know, this is the view equals view. And if you go to view equals. What's going on here? Close uh, view equals describe. You actually get the. You, you get some metadata for it and it's all it's all linked data. So if you actually negotiate for. Uh, for RDF from this URI or even. Actually, because of the way this works, uh, so this is kind of an escaped URI, but I can actually take this and. What is going on with this? Well, you've got a DOI for it. I think there's some DOI something. You could do that, yeah. Um, but the uh, and there are other ways of making um, data sets where you actually set the DO, set the URIs uh, explicitly. Um, let's see here. So the other thing that I guess the question is what is where does it put this metadata? It put it into um the uh so this I'm gonna make this a little bit bigger. So there's this uh URI here that was used. Yeah. And so that actually is oh wait, sorry. That actually pulls through to one, two, sorry, draw that one. So that passes through to localhost, which I don't seem to have mapped properly at the moment. Um, to display uh, that same data set. Although well, I, I guess that question is where is it relative to what you can construct in or this is its own thing, right? So, um, because of the, because of the original use case for it, um, auto generated URI using UUIDs. So that's what, that's what this is here. Um, this is just, oh, by the way, here's what. Right, exactly. Yeah. 
But the cool thing is, is that, so now we have this data set as well. Um, although, what's going on? Uh, suddenly, oh, wait, right, there we go. So, so this is the actual file that we downloaded before, or we uploaded. And actually, if I strip this off the end, it will serve up the file. Um, yeah, so it's loading it in numbers, yay. Um, but basically, so yeah, it's, uh, it's it serves up the actual file when you access it without, without, without as a default view. So you can actually use the URIs as just to serve the date, the file itself. So, so that's been really impressive. Right, exactly. Yeah, so that's um, so if I go here, if I put if I paste this in here, um, so partly because this is so what we're looking at is basically the same. This this goes to the same place. Um, view equals new. Wait, what did I do? Oh, view equals, sorry, view equals view. So if I don't have view equals view on it, it'll just serve up the file again. But so, so yeah, so that's, uh, what we do is when we're just generating URIs, for the most part, we use this about shortcut so that we can reference anything in the graph. So that's kind of the safest way to reference things, yeah. but the about way, but without, but the LOD prefix method makes it basically lets you serve up linked data for the entities that you are directly um, responsible for in the graph and for the things that you uh, really want to show that way. And so they're really good entry points for that. The, um, right, so uh, the other cool thing though is that I can do um, SDD uh, census. S-E-C-E-N-S-U-S. -E I think I uh, corrected it in time. Because <laughs> this only comes from that. Um, okay. So the other thing we can do is, uh, rather than just use, using that form, we can actually upload individual files as well. So what I'm, I'm going to do that real quick with the uh, semantic data dictionary for this, which is a uh, Excel file. And so you notice this extracted, so it's figured out, um, so added when it was created, uh, extracted the content type, and this file ID is actually the reference into uh, a file repository for, for use internally. It's just easiest to just put it in the knowledge graph. Um, and it also marked me as the contributor again. So it knows that I created the, um, it, it's basically gleaned as much uh, provenance off of the transaction automatically as possible. I mean, I only like give it two, two pieces of information. Hmm. So then you just, so, uh, so you'll notice that I went to, I just made up this, uh, SDD census URI, and there wasn't really anything there. I was just saying, there's this thing, I don't know anything about it, here's what I know, which is nothing. Now it knows a bit more about it because I did that upload. I could have just as easily done about URI equals and then the URL to, to where it's going. 
uh, and that would give me that would give us the same thing. Uh, one thing, so it also gave types, so it actually uh, uh, pulled out the uh, the type from the uh, content type. Uh, these URIs are actually related to the um, in, uh, the, uh, the the media types from uh, that that are used everywhere. And so it actually has a URI for each of those. Um, the other uh, cool thing. Oh wait, did I? This would have been We essentially have the previous. Right. Yeah. Oh wait, I need to add one. You go across with. Yeah. Um, not data, where is it? So, um, there's another, uh, another bit of another ontology that I wanted to add. So the semantic data dictionary ontology as, um, where is it? Uh, SCD ontology. This has some information about, uh, DCAT and semantic data dictionaries and other things. So this is valuable to bring in because before we didn't know anything about um, we didn't know anything about semantic data dictionaries. Now we've added a bit more vocabulary, and what we can do is we can add a type of uh, oops, semantic data dictionary, which wasn't there before. Submit adds it to the type list. Uh, doesn't. What just happened? Did I, did I crash something? Small copy. Yeah. <laughs> Let's try that again. Okay, well. No, it's still broken. What did I do? So, describe what you were trying to do was only apply that strength. Oh, yeah. Why is it actually holding? Oh. It's your STD view. Your STD view is broken. Okay, let's not worry about that. It's your fault. Wait a minute. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so I just wanted to upload it and set the type. Apparently, that's that caused it. Yeah, so um, view equals view. So what I can do from here, from the actual, from the original uh, data set. So now that I've added that as a, a piece, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say. Um, uh, I'm going to add a few bits of information to this, and what it's going to do is it's going to trigger that uh, I'm going to link the SDD to that data set so that it can process it and add it as a, a, add it as a graph. So I'm going to add this as an attribute URI space, which is from void uh, local, and then um, 2010. I'm going to add um, to this. I'm going to move myself out of the way. Oh, that's annoying. Okay, so I'm going to um, uh, right. I need to add an attribute here of delimiter. It knows that it's a CSV, but it doesn't like CSV doesn't mean anything necessarily. You don't know what the delimiter is for that automatically. So I'm going to add that as a delimiter for this file. I'm going to add. I'm going to and then add uh, a link uh, from forms. Is 
So I'm, yeah, there we go. Conforms to, and then uh, the census file, which we already have in there. So that adds that as a link. And what should be happening now? So it's doing that stuff. And actually, if I go into uh, run logs, say that log, it's actually transforming the data into RDF already. And it's conversion. Yep. Yeah, and there's something, something break. Wait, hold on. Something went wrong. Did it break? So conceptually what you've done is shoot. No, that was not Right. Why what you got that was to be building? Why did I say this? Law, the raw data that's up there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What is that? Uh, is that stand by itself? Or is that a Google? Okay. Sorry, the where is the graph which you created? Is that in here? Sorry. Right, yeah. So the data set itself is now um, this is essentially a view. Right. So one thing that happens in here, yeah. So uh, this is, uh, but basically, it's not just a view. It's actually been added to the knowledge graph itself. Well, it's, it's yeah. I'm, I'm saying it's it's added to the knowledge graph itself. Yes. And, my question was where, and then what I'm saying, uh, asking this is where essentially where you added the data originally. No, well, well, so it's a knowledge graph, right? <laughs> There's no where in a knowledge graph. There's subject predicate object graph, and so everything. Well, so first off, there's the URI for the data set. Yeah. Right. Well, so first off, it's more than one graph, but also um, the the um, the actual subtle actually yeah the subtle script doesn't show quite everything. Um, there's uh, there's a couple of links that we could probably put into this that would make that easier to 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 navigate, um, but. Essentially, in the uh, nano publication trace, the the uh, all the nano publications that are output from the semantic ETL script are linked to this to the subtle script, which has a link to the SDD and this file in it. And so, when, let's see if I look at this. This might actually have a this is more direct usage of it. Right. So this is actually from the subtle script itself. This we used of, which is kind of silly. But yeah, that th this should have we should probably have a bit more in there about that. But what's happening is that there's a series of nano publications that are generated, one for each row in the data file. That are traceable at the uh, at the nano publication level back to. Back to this. Yeah, so I through this through the subject. Yeah, so it's it's not 
Right. Yes. So that's that's a, a lot more complex than my. I'm kind of thinking is. Right. Do I do I that? Yeah. Right. There is no child graph. It's just another graph. It's another subgraph of the knowledge graph. Yeah, it was generated. This is derived from that. I should wrap it up. Yeah. So I'm going to show really quickly the. So we use um, sparkle to, or we use the, the um, yes, GUI interface to, uh, to do stuff. Um, and then there's also the. There's this visualization piece that is pretty cool. Um, and so the, um, right, so this will show all the instances in there. Oops, I'll go this. Section. Unfortunately, not all classes have labels in this department, but it's, uh, so we typically turn them into what? Yeah. Yeah. Oh wait, it's still okay. So it's actually run this. So we can do um, a no. Um, no, that's not the right one. What did I end up putting in here? Um. And yes, I promise I'm going to wrap up very soon. So prefixes. So that this is the, these are the counties from the data set. Um, and this is not actually going to do anything. So distinct X. And this will actually this won't show anything yet. Table wasn't showing that yet. So what it's doing is it's processing through all the nano publications right now and basically saying, hey, is there anything that we could further determine from each of these new fragments? There's one reason why it's all kind of broken up into those small pieces to make it more digestible. Um, and so it's kind of working its way through that right now. Um, and so the population, oh, right, that isn't there. Why didn't that show up anywhere? Live demo. Live demo. Gotta love it. Sire population. XK. Um, Sire. All right, so is that 
Okay, so it's basically has all these population objects in there. And actually, I can show you. Show you one. We'll see if it actually is right. But, uh, the other thing is that since this is, I mean, I could have just gone to there, but like my local house was set up right on my computer. But um, right now it's kind of chugging through all this stuff, so it's a bit. There we go. Instance of population. And it doesn't look like it was connected to anything, but it did have. Take the time interval of uh, January 1st, 2020, uh, and or 2010, and the count. Yeah, it lost the link to the uh, Yeah. Um, here, I want to show you the actual data because I want to kind of want to prove that I did get it to convert properly at this point. Uh, data. Um, yeah, it's demo data. Okay. Okay, so yeah, so this is the data that what was actually being converted here in Medina County, Ohio, so part of. So this is the yeah. Oh. Right. Yeah, and so each gets its own name graph, and then. Um. And so here it's got the link to the different things and then um, all right. Assertion hub info has the link of uh, the, you know, this was associated with a particular row in the data. Um, and then this is a CSV row as a row number, so you can trace it back to a specific row in the file. Uh, it was, per, uh, and then this was derived from. Oh, that's all the same. Um, hold on a second. Of info, assertion and provenance, right? Here. Provenance isn't there. Okay, so yeah, so I, I probably should expand on what's actually available in there a little bit. But um, in terms of linking it back to the original data set. Um, but, um, you know, this is uh, the idea is that it's, you know, it's still um, you know, more or less available. In there, and uh, but it's actually doing that conversion uh, kind of systematically as it back in as more pieces of the graph, and those can be processed by other uh, agents as well. So, and I'll ask what I think. Yeah. Right so next week. Uh, They picked up this thing called the floating solo, the Cobos floating solo explorer, which is a very interesting app for several of what could CIM is. Political boundaries. Yeah. No, at its core, it's kind of like in data. Mm -hmm. Right. So, the real challenge with these is the kind of thing where you can conceptualize a data, like, like, a lot. 
Challenge people to think about. It's a 